If a military cargo plane crashed in the middle of town, leaving you trapped inside a storage lot with the horrible monster it was hauling, what would you do? With no help coming and no way out, our only hope is to put this thing down before it tears us all to pieces. But it's seven feet tall with razor sharp claws and a poor disposition, you'd better believe this freak won't be letting us off easy. Oh, and just to make matters worse, our ex is here to dump an extra layer of interpersonal conflict directly on top of an already jacked up situation. So yeah, get ready for that. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the escaped alien in Storage 24. Charlie's going through a bad breakup, which is why he and his best friend Mark are currently stuck in traffic on their way to clean out his share of the storage unit he held with his ex. Well, part of the reason, anyway. Turns out the gridlock was caused by a plane crash somewhere in downtown London, which by itself should be enough for any rational human being to take the next exit and try again some other time. After all, it could take days for them to clean up the crash site, during which time, road congestion will probably be every bit as bad. And then there's the fact that this clearly wasn't your typical jetliner that went down, which even these two imbeciles might realize if they actually bothered listening to what's being said on the radio. But we've been told that the aircraft may have been a military cargo plane. A quarantine area around central London is in effect, and we've been told to expect... Expect what? Radiation leaks? Zombie plagues? Why would you turn it off at the single most important part of the broadcast? You two might very well be heading straight towards certain death. Especially with that bit about the government setting up a quarantine. You know, because those always go great. Of course, they're not the only ones to completely abandon all common sense and put themselves in harm's way. Just get a load of Goldilocks strolling through ground zero like Fido's exercise matters more than her life. Lady, those are literal ashes you're walking on right now. You're really gonna stop beside burning debris to call your husband about this. Unless he's Captain Hindsight, there's nothing he can do. Oh, but fear not, taxpayer. Here comes the convoy of G-men to make this whole thing disappear. And by that, I mean make the witnesses disappear and then gaslight the public into believing it was just a truck backfiring. For real though, time to GTFO before someone decides you saw something you shouldn't have. Kinda like this giant metal mystery box that clearly came off the plane. Besides, if the feds don't get you, whatever gleeked out all that monster goo probably will. <laughs> Well, sounds like Foxy's left the building. If only there was some kind of thick, durable strap you could have attached to her collar to keep her restrained and out of trouble. But as far as I know, no such device has ever existed. Oh wait, it's called a leash, which your pathetic let go of twice. That said, we should have cut our losses after the first time. Suffice to say, if your dog runs into a spooky warehouse next to an open slime spattered government lockbox thing, you don't have a dog anymore. And going in after her is how you wind up getting a totally gutless, implied off-screen death like Blondie here. Besides, then you have the opportunity to get a new dog that isn't stupid. <sighs> Oh well, it's not like she could have known just how utterly horrifying the contents of that box truly were. Classic military transporting extremely dangerous cargo gone horribly wrong. It's the crazies all over again. Hopefully someday they'll learn not to move unspeakable bioweapons and vicious alien monsters through spirit air. Until then, at least put some kind of tracking device on the container so that the person to roll up on it isn't some random idiot out walking her dog. Sometime later, Mark and Charlie arrive at the storage lot to find that the plane crash caused the building's security shutters to descend on their own. Let me repeat that. This place was close enough to the crash site that the impact severely damaged one of their critical systems. Not to mention the fact that one of the jet turbines crushed a car outside in the parking lot. I mean, sure, it's not like I'd expect another one to come down here anytime soon, but don't you think we might just be a little too close to the action right now? Eh, whatever. It'll just be a quick trip in and out. See, the repairman's already got it taken care of. No, no, no. You know what I gotta do now, don't you? You mean, besides punch yourself in the face for not immediately wedging something under the gate? The whole reason you're out here is because the 
thing closed on its own. What are the chances that might happen again? As for our heroes, the moment that thing starts whirring back to life again, I'm ducking back underneath it and calling it a night. Who wants to be stuck in a place like this, waiting on another, potentially even dumber repairman to come out and add himself to the equation? Fortunately, it shouldn't have come to that. As it turns out, Handyman just needs to head on down to the basement and hack the mainframe or whatever to get this thing up and running again. He just has to find it. That is assuming something doesn't find him first. Meanwhile, Charlie and Mark arrive at the storage unit to find Charlie's ex, Shelly, and her friends, Nikki and Chris, just happen to pick the exact same day to come down here. Well, this isn't awkward at all, especially the way Charlie insists on having it out here and now in front of God and everybody like we're on a freaking soap opera. Face it, dude. It's someone else's turn. Probably that guy she told you not to worry about. Definitely not Chris, though. He's a total chump. Thankfully, the constantly fluctuating power situation reminds Charlie just how stupid it was to come down here in the first place, before we're forced to endure any more of this garbage. Except, guess what? You're still stuck in here until the shutter's fixed, and that could take hours. Especially with Mr. Fixit sitting down on the job right now. Are you done yet, mate? Yeah, don't go thinking that terrifying alien monster is going to change that one out of five Yelp review I'm giving you. Lucky for yellow shirt guy, the creature decided to reveal itself for no apparent reason instead of immediately ripping his spine out. Guess it must enjoy the thrill of the chase. Whatever the case, Wagey Bro should have used his head start to barricade the absolute out of the basement door instead of just standing there waiting for it to smash its way through. As if a flimsy interior door could ever possibly stop something like that. Sure, running and hiding is also an option, but it doesn't change the fact that we're trapped in here. And right now, the only man that knows how to get us untrapped is currently gurgling in a pool of his own drippings. Sooner or later, that thing is going to get out into the rest of the facility, and when it does, we need to have a plan if we want to keep our spleens intact. In that case, I have three. Option one, we grab our official storage 24 bolt cutters and break into units until we find loaded up with tons of crap. From there, we just shut the door and bury ourselves in the junk, at which point we sit quietly until well after the screaming stops. Yeah, central to this plan is not telling the customers what's going on. That way, they take all the aggro while we cozy up in people's tchotchkes. Also couldn't hurt to smash our way into the vending machine and grab some snacks if we have time. Who knows how much of a fight these other customers will put up. We could be in here for a while. Now, you're probably wondering what the end game is there. After all, we'd still be stuck in here alongside the Beastie Boy, right? Well, maybe not. Unless it snuck in through the front door in a trench coat, the creature must have gotten in through the basement somehow, meaning it could just as easily leave once it gets bored. Sure, we'd be taking a huge risk poking our heads out when the time comes, but is that greater than our other choices? Well, let's find out. Plan number two also involves hiding without telling the others, but instead of hunting for the sweet spot, we post up in the units closest to the basement door. This time, we just hang out until we hear the others actively being torn to shreds, at which point we pop out and run down to the basement to try and find the route which the monster took to get in. Unfortunately, right off the bat, there's a couple huge problems with this one. First of all, we have no way of knowing whether there's just the one, so we run the risk of leaving our hiding spot only to bump into another on the way down. We also don't know if this hypothetical escape route is even navigable for us. Sure, the creature looks big, but for all we know, it can compress its ribcage to the width of a household sponge, or the path might involve a 30-foot climb up a vertical concrete shaft. Of course, both of these strats rely on the assumption that this freak show doesn't have some kind of extraordinary sensory perception that would allow it to suss out our hiding spot right off the bat. And since we don't know anything about it, that's totally possible. But I don't think it's enough to dismiss these ideas outright. That said, if we want to eliminate that possibility altogether, we'll have to go with option three, which involves running over to the others immediately and enlisting their help killing this with whatever weapons we can find and or improvise. Naturally, we won't say it's a literal monster since we need them to actually believe us. Instead, we'll tell them an unhinged man with a machete murdered the repairman and almost got us too. As for how we even got in, who cares? Dude has a machete, and the fact that we're stuck in here means we'll have to go through him to reach the utility box what's-his-name was messing with to open the shutters. Oh, and in case you're thinking we can just dig in somewhere and call the cops, we can't, because
because obviously all landlines and cell phones had to suddenly stop working for some reason. If we're lucky, one of the other storage customers might have told the buyback to suck it easy and filled his unit full of illegal semi-automatic firearms and armor-piercing ammunition. I wouldn't count on it though. Matter of fact, I wouldn't bank on us finding much more than croquet mallets, golf clubs, and the odd cricket bat. Still, even if Lancelot himself left Excalibur in one of these things, I'd still put our chances of success in the single digits. Fact is, we don't know anything about our enemy. Strengths, weaknesses, allergies, nothing. On the other hand, it definitely knows just how soft, squishy, and vulnerable we are. So it probably wouldn't bat an eye at the sight of us charging straight for it, armed with a bunch of random garbage. Especially if it has backup. Either way, I'll be sure to stay at the rear of the stack in case things go like I think they're gonna go. So, that's about it. Let me know which of these options you to choose down in the comments. Or, if you think you're better than me, go ahead and shatter my mind all to pieces with your stunning intellect and god-tier monster fighting skills. Me, I'm going with option one, because it makes the fewest assumptions and basically lets us sit around drinking Mr. Pib and eating peanut M&Ms while listening to a whole bunch of randoms we don't care about getting brutally slaughtered. Evidently, Yellow Shirt agrees, as Chris randomly finds him catatonic in some creep mannequin hoarder's unit. But of course, if the average idiot can find your hiding spot without even trying, you'd better believe the extraterrestrial super predator can too. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. The false ceiling. I'll admit, not something I thought about when putting my plans together. Then again, it probably wouldn't have made a difference had he remembered to close the door. Or, at the very least, curl up out of sight in there to keep from jump-scaring a rando into giving him away. The good news for everybody else is that shirt bro probably wasn't gonna be all that much help anyway. Plus, his death does serve to teach us a couple things about the monster's behavior. The fact that it yoinked him up into the ceiling instead of jumping in to kill both of us suggests it prefers to ambush unsuspecting prey instead of risking a direct confrontation. That means, despite our probable status as puny humans in its eyes, it still considers us formidable enough to avoid a stand-up fight two-on-one. -on -one. And the fact that it chose to travel through the vents instead of strolling through the aisles only supports this point. The way I see it, that means it's probably vulnerable enough for us to put it down given enough effort. However, don't let that fool you into thinking this will be easy. After all, tigers also prefer the sneaky route, and, well, try taking one of those on with a crowbar. Unfortunately, no one but Chris is going to learn about this, because instead of immediately running back to his friends to report the situation, he simply takes the last guy's place among the mannequins. Seriously, you'd think he'd at least want to get out of the room he saw someone get taken from. Even Yellow Shirt had enough brains to do that. Elsewhere in the building, it seems Charlie still thinks he and Shelly can smooth things over, but it's pretty clear she no longer wants anything to do with the man. Lucky for him, he has a friend like Mark, who's willing to go in after her to try... Oh, oh no. So it's like that, huh? Jesus, imagine having so little respect for someone you can't even wait another hour or two before you go stab him in the back. Oh, well, as long as you both remember to put all your clothes all the way back on before leaving the box, Charlie won't have to know about this, and you can avoid making an already extremely awkward situation about a billion times worse. Oh, Yes, do it, Charlie. Give in to your anger. Okay, for real though, you can hear your extremely recent ex approaching, who you dumped over the phone, I might add, and you don't even think to finish getting dressed before walking out. I mean, yeah, it was just one sleeve, but at the same time, it was just one sleeve. Oh, well, at least now Charlie knows for sure why things fell apart. Plus, now he also knows who to sacrifice to save his own neck when things inevitably go to... Although, at least at this point, the thought probably hasn't occurred to him since he still hasn't found out about the monster. Hmm. Nah, it probably still has. Luckily, he won't have too much time to dwell on it, as he and Nikki suddenly find Chris whimpering audibly in the mannequin room. And that's not all they find. There's nothing up here. <laughs> 
Man, talk about a close one. That blurred out blob on the screen almost nailed us. Of course, we could have avoided looking there in the first place if crying Chris could pull himself together long enough to explain what just went down. Yes, I know everyone's gonna be like, no way, you must be crazy. But Jesus, dude, are you really gonna let a significant portion of your available manpower get decapitated sticking his head up there like that? Besides, this thing already killed one man in here. If we let it get a twofer, that just really reflects poorly on humanity as a whole. That said, Chris shouldn't have to say anything for us to realize we need to leave this spot right now. Charlie just saw the mangled corpse of a storage employee get dragged off into the ductwork. And yet, here we are, still standing around, mere feet from where someone was brutally killed, as though a half-inch thick ceiling tile could possibly protect us from literally anything. Even if you don't think it's the work of a monster, which they don't because Chris still refuses to say anything even remotely useful. You should still be concerned about the prospects of a crazy person roaming the halls looking for trouble. And there just so happens to be one. I think I don't know who you're working for. You sent her a message for me. Well, we can certainly try. Gotta admit, I never would have seen something like this coming. Nutjob nearly gave Nikki her last whitening. I'm joking, of course. Dude seems unhinged, for sure. But I don't think he was actually trying to kill her. However, because some people just refuse to open their mouths, everyone just assumes he's the one who killed Yellow Shirt. Because why wouldn't they? So, what do they do next? Well, tie him up for questioning in the mannequin unit, of course. Where, once again, we just saw someone's mutilated remains get dragged off into oblivion. Sure, if they think he's the one responsible, I get how they might assume there's no threat. Except, why would they automatically assume he was working alone? Do you really think some skinny old fart jagwired up a human body up there on his own? And even if he did, why would he then leave his sniping spot to force a confrontation on their level armed with nothing but an Electra toothbrush? Eventually, we come to find out the man lives here, having moved in following a divorce to hide his remains remaining wealth from his ex-wife's attorneys. Since then, he created the costume of the alien monster to scare people away from the storage lot so Mary's private eyes would never track him down. And he would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for all these meddling punks and their dog. I'm joking, of course. That was Scooby-Doo. He's obviously not the murderer, which everyone eventually pieces together just in time for the real killer to come rip the door off their little non-hideout. <laughs> Well, that figures. Chris finally broke out of his stupor to do something idiotic. You're really gonna run out the door the monster pulled open. What world do you live in where that's a better idea than staying with the group? I mean, yes, I've been heavily criticizing their decision to stay in there this whole time, but right now it clearly beats the alternative. If anything, Chris should have told everyone to hit the deck and keep their mouths shut lest they wind up getting pulled up into the ceiling. Besides, we all know there's no way out of here, so where exactly are you planning on fleeing to right now? If anything, you're just gonna wind up cornering yourself somewhere and getting ripped apart. Like so. <laughs> Well, at least it was quick. The good news is that Chris's little mad dash for freedom bought the others time to finally leave the mannequin unit. The bad news is that it wasn't Mark or Shelly, but there's still plenty of movie left to go. So God willing, there's a chance for them to have parts ripped off as well. For now, the plan is to sneak over to Simon Pegg's anti-alimony bunker since it locks from the inside. Well, I say sneak, but they make absolutely zero effort to stay quiet the whole way, which is why old Face Fingers is currently hot on their trail. Now, if only the geezer could stop thrashing his keys long enough to open the thing. As a matter of fact, this would be a great time to tell you about the Ridge's signature key case. No more rattling, jingling, and fumbling around with an O-ring full of keys while being hunted down by a giant praying mantis. However, by some miracle, the homeowner is able to work through his archaic key holding device just in time for everyone to make it inside without getting sliced. Gee, nice place you got, bro. Nothing says well-adjusted human being quite like a wall of televisions turned to every single news station. Then again, the man 
man does live in a storage unit, so I'm not sure what I was expecting. And speaking of the news, it seems the situation outside has escalated beyond the plane crash. The military showing up in force, deploying tanks and fighter jets in anticipation of something nasty. Meanwhile, there's reports of strange aircraft approaching the city, which the old man quite reasonably links to our new best friend. Oh my god, listen to a guy lives in a storage unit, he's clearly crazy. Okay, let's imagine for one second that what you're saying is, is... Dude, seriously? Are we really about to have this conversation right now? Oh, aliens, that's preposterous. Did you not see that horrible monster hand nearly tear someone's head off as you all nearly made it inside? Yeah, you know what? Forget it. It doesn't matter where this thing came from. All that matters is where it's going, which is straight to... After all, the thing saw us coming here, and the walls and ceiling in this spam cam are nowhere near reinforced enough to keep it out for very long. Ultimately, it's only a matter of time before that sucker gets inside, and if we're not prepared when that happens, it's gonna be a bloodbath. Furthermore, given what's going on outside, I'd say there's no chance someone's gonna be coming to rescue us anytime soon. In that case, we're also gonna have to find a way past the shutters ourselves, which means a trip down to the basement to finish what the repair guy started. First things first, we need weapons if we're gonna have any chance of making it down there in one piece. Problem is, Bathrobe doesn't have any lying around this pigsty, and he calls this place a hideout, for Christ's sake. Fortunately, he does know where to find them, or at least he thinks he does. We just have to find a way into the other units without getting caught out in the open and brutally killed by a bloodthirsty nightmare creature. But it turns out, that's not quite as impossible as it sounds. We need to get to the far end, that's where all the larger units are. That's all the good stuff is. So, wait, all these quote-unquote secure storage units are connected by air ducts large enough for a grown man to crawl through. Whose bright idea was that? Well, whatever. This mind-boggling architectural blunder might very well save our lives. That is, were it not for two major issues. First, as I've already explained, this is London. We'll be lucky to dig up a couple kitchen knives and a slingshot. And right now, we're needing the holy hand grenade. Second, all this aluminum ductwork is going to make moving quietly pretty much impossible. And considering the monster's claws were able to leave those marks on the steel door, it'll probably rip straight through the ducts and into our intestines before we make it to the next unit. All this is to say, Mark should definitely be going first. But of course, the absolute scumbag is going to make all of zero effort to atone for his betrayal. I totally get what Shelly sees in him. Fact is, this will almost certainly be a one-way trip. And even if it's not, I highly doubt the end results will be worth the wasted time. Besides, you mean to tell me that amongst all this dude's crap, there's nothing, not one thing we could use to bonk, stab, or otherwise injure this freak show? No sports equipment or tools or cutlery or even booze we could use to make Molotov cocktails? Give me a break. I mean, just look at all these analog televisions. Worst case scenario, we could always smash a couple over its head WWE style. Oh well, I guess we're doing this. And by some miracle, Mark and Charlie managed to successfully loot all the connected storage units without being attacked. The reward for all this? A crowbar, a hammer, a steak knife, two Toys R Us walkie-talkies, and a pack of illegal fireworks. Well, it's all definitely better than nothing, assuming we actually live long enough to use any of it. <laughs> Gee, thanks bro. Least he could have done was toss us one of the weapons so we'd at least have a fighting chance. Actually, the way E.T. was breaking through underneath him, there's a chance a slightly less spineless partner would have been able to strike from above once the creeper stuck its head through the opening. I don't care what planet you're from, a crowbar through the top of the skull isn't gonna make your day any better. Naturally, brave, brave Sir Robin decides to tell everyone Charlie bit the dust to make himself look better, which, let's be honest, he totally would have, were it not for an inordinate amount of plot armor. Sure, he might have made it out of the ducks okay, but no way he's walking away from this next close encounter armed with nothing but stuffed animals. <laughs>
yeah, I'm sure that would totally happen. This creature traverses God knows how many light years in order to get here, likely using technology far beyond our comprehension, just to wind up bamboozled by a wind-up toy? Since when did this turn into one of those movies? In any sane universe, the only way Charlie would have been walking out of that situation would have been by not attracting its attention by kicking the door down in the first place. Sure, you definitely don't want to get cornered in such a confined space, but like I said before, nothing's getting through those ducks without making a ton of noise, meaning we'd know about it far enough in advance to bust our way out and still have somewhat of a head start to find another hiding place. Last thing we'd want to do is break the door down when, for all we know, the thing is standing right outside waiting for us, which it totally was. Regardless of how we do it, once we break line of sight on this thing, we should head for the basement as we know that's where the rest of the group should be headed, provided they're all still in one piece. However, as luck would have it, we won't even have to go that far before finding everyone alive and well. That is, except for the big fat bruise welling up on Mark's ego. I mean, just look at that dirty look his homie hopping girlfriend gave him just now. It's almost like she realized the kind of guy who'd swoop his best bud's girlfriend might not be super trustworthy. Crazy, right? Unfortunately, the semi-joyous reunion is short-lived, as Charlie still has daddy long legs hot on his trail. Smart. His ex-wife will never be able to find him if he's mangled beyond recognition. As for the rest of us, we should take advantage of Bathrobe's noble sacrifice and make a plan to end this freak show. After all, we have no idea where to even start looking once we make it to the basement, much less what to do once we find what we're looking for. Meaning, it's almost certainly going to track us down before we even come close to getting the shutters open. The good news is, our little scab run turned up everything we need to get the job done, particularly the walkie-talkie and fireworks. First thing we need to do is repackage the powder charges in those bottle rockets to amplify the effect. Of course, this is something we should have done back in the bachelor pad. Like, how exactly were we planning on using them otherwise? As a cudgel? Just imagine how much more effective the old man's sacrifice play would have been had he bear hugged the sucker with an IED strapped to his chest. Naturally, YouTube won't let me go too deep on that, but effectively, we need to turn those 10 small charges into one big one. I'm sure you're all smart enough to fill in the blanks on that one. If not, there's always ChatGPT. Once that's ready, we'll want to place one of the walkies in an empty storage unit, preferably one with other unlocked units all around it we can have people hide in. Using the other walkie, we'll have our weakest group member transmit their voice to lure in the monster. Safe to say at this point, it's using sound to track us through the facility, so as long as we all stay quiet, it should come right to the sound of our decoy. That said, the person doing the talking will also be making noise, so we'll want to put them in a more tightly packed container to minimize the echo. Should also probably bury their heads in clothing and chunk to muffle their speech even further. Once the target enters the trap container, we'll light the charge using Mark's matches and toss it inside before holding the door closed. If we're lucky, the blast alone will do the trick, but given it'll be more of a concussion grenade, we should plan on barging in afterwards to finish it off with our hand tools while it's dazed. Instead, what we get from the brain trust is about as dumb as it gets. Okay, you two go that way, Nikki, and I'll go this way. Yeah, sure, let's split up. How could that possibly end in disaster? Plus, not only do they still refuse to maximize their resources by modifying the fireworks, they're spreading their firepower even thinner by splitting up. Nah, I get it. Now's his chance to get back at Shelly by schmoozing her best friend. And what better conditions to make a move than a filthy spider-infested basement with a monster tracking you down? Seriously though, absent any firearms or explosives, our only chance of putting this thing down is by attacking in force with everything we have. Pairing off like this will only make it easier for it to pick us off, which is exactly what ends up happening. Oh, and it turns out, splitting up wasn't even necessary in the first place, as Team Charlie finds the repairman and his magic shutter opening device almost immediately. Now, instead of heading back to the entrance as a group and holding the line while we button mash our way to freedom, we have to go find Shelly, who, wait a minute, Shelly got taken? Yeah, actually, never mind, we're good here. Screw that 
Right, Charlie? We'll have to go find him. No, it's too late for that. We have Bro, give it a rest for the love of God. Let's assume for one second that she wasn't immediately destroyed like literally everyone else who's been grabbed by this thing. Do you really think she'd do the same for you, given the way she ripped her guts out without a second thought? The only downside to this development is that Mark didn't get nailed too. Which, going by what we've seen from him so far, is probably because he bravely tapped her kneecaps to buy himself time to escape. Time to move on, dude. It's over. Still doesn't mean that I want to see her get hurt, and you know what? I got nothing to lose now, so I'm gonna go and fight that thing. Holy man, nothing to lose? You got cheated on and dumped. It's not like your whole family was murdered. Can it with the melodrama? This is far from the end of the world. Well, probably. At any rate, back amongst the storage units, it seems the super beast still hasn't popped a cork on this chick for whatever reason. Although, if I had to guess, it's trying to figure out just what kind of lowly degenerate life form it's looking at. Whatever it is, the monster's hesitance lends her an opportunity to use her special backstabbing powers for something other than evil, giving her just enough time to trap herself behind a flimsy metal lift gate it could easily rip open at any time. I mean, it's not like she had a ton of options at this point, but it seems to me that even the sheet metal doors on one of the storage units would have been a better option than this. At least then, it wouldn't be able to easily spot her from down the hall. As for Charlie, if he's really determined to save Shelly's life, he needs to start making a ton of noise to lure it away from her. Otherwise, it's just gonna tear him in half like a phone book and go right back to attacking her, thereby making his sacrifice entirely pointless. In that case, I'd start banging on the metal doors as hard as I could to draw the aggro. Grow. Then, once I knew it was on my tail, I'd haul back to the main entrance to force Mark into the fight as well. God knows if I'm going out, he is coming with me. Fortunately for our hero, it may not come to that, as it seems Nikki finally realized that the explosives she's been carrying around all this time are in fact explosives. Now, we just need someone brave enough to ram them down the monster's throat, and it turns out Charlie just knows the man for the job. Well then, that seems like quite a lot to stake on a wind-up toy. I mean, what if it turned around at some point? Or, you know, the monster just kicked it away like it did earlier? Probably would have been a better idea to light all the fuses and rush the in hopes we could jam a couple into its freaky sideways mouth before it could rip our arms off. At least then we'd know for sure if it worked. On that note, no way I'm running in for the emotional hug without first seeing a few piles of monster guts on the floor. Given everything she's put us through, the least Shelly could do is come to us afterwards. Oh well, either way, I'm sure the creature is totally gone for good. So nothing to do now except open the shutters and breathe in that sweet air of freedom. Or whatever passes for it in London. But of course, it couldn't be that easy. Once again, Mark decided he was going to screw us over to save his own skin. Although this time, he did a pretty lousy job of it. For real, dude, the least you could have done is barricade the doors with office furniture to keep them from casually kicking their way in after only a couple tries. Besides, your so-called friends weren't the only thing you were trying to keep out of here. Oh no, it totally wasn't gone for good. And by the looks of it, it's not just extra crispy, it's also extra in fact, the monster's so angry, it's decided to throw us around a bit instead of simply killing us right away. You know, to teach us a lesson. However, what it fails to realize is that by prolonging our suffering, it's only giving us an opportunity to find something we can kill it with. Something I don't believe we've ever seen before on this channel. I just want to go home. Wow. What a twist. Okay, jokes aside, please don't tell me you're gonna assume it's dead after a single poke to the thorax. For all we know, you just hit the snooze button on this thing, and we have come way too far to get griefed this close to extraction. At least mash its head with the crowbar a few dozen times to make sure it's really down for the count. In fact, while one of us is working on the door, the other two should be trading off beating this thing until what's left of it could fall through a strain.
dinner. You know what? Fine. Whatever. It's finally over. And with that, Charlie, Shelly, and Nikki are free to move on with their lives as newly single Brits. Except not really. Because it turns out this whole time we were playing hide and seek in the storage lot, the plot of Independence Day was playing out in real time everywhere else. Looks like we're gonna need a lot more toy poodles. In the end, only Charlie, Shelly, and Nikki survived to kneel before our new alien overlords. However, had we taken some initiative and savagely beat Chris until he told us what happened to the storage employee, we might have had enough warning to either hide in hopes the monster left on its own, or arm ourselves for a brutal fight to the death. Of course, once we met up with Bathrobe and rounded up the fireworks, we could have put my trap plan in action and barbecued this sucker without taking any further casualties. For that reason, I think Storage 24 was beat. Moral of the story, if you see something, say something. Especially if what you saw looks like this.